Andrew Kissel was a fraud said to be worth around $20 million. But as his scams and schemes came to light, his empire began to crumble. Following the death of his brother through a separate and non-related murder, the pain made him fall even further into a web full of lies and deceit. Until, one day, just before he was scheduled to go to trial, Andrew was found murdered in his own basement. But who exactly killed Andrew Kissel? Well, with so many enemies, authorities had no idea where to begin. Could it perhaps have been his ex-wife or her family, the many friends and investors he betrayed over the years, or perhaps a stranger who is in the know? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Now, this case feels kind of like a game of Cluedo, but today we're answering those questions. This video will eventually pick up where the case of Robert and Nancy Kissel finished, and although this case is not a direct continuation of that story, it is worth watching that one beforehand. But before we begin, and just to let you know, that I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that is your sort of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, buckle up, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Andrew Kissel. In true coffeehouse crime fashion, we begin by setting the scene with a location. Welcome to Connecticut, folks. Now, first of all, I have a bone to pick with you guys, but I can clearly see three C's in the name. And although, granted, Connecticut doesn't roll off the tongue very well, I just don't see why you pronounce something so different to how it's written. Anyway, renowned for its excellent universities, beautiful autumnal foliage, and rich contributions to American culture, the Constitution State will forever remain important to Americans. But what else is it best known for? Starting with the good stuff, Connecticut has made its mark in the culinary world. It is famous for its hot lobster rolls, steamed cheeseburgers, apitza, and even the more unconventional apple cider donuts. And although we have Germany to thank for hot dogs, this state serves them in a whole different breed of excellence. Connecticut has an attitude of all things money, as finance, insurance, and real estate are colossal industries here, and a further 350,000 residents are employed in education, health, and social services. It's also a key player in the manufacturing and agriculture industries. But did you know that Connecticut is home to one of the world's most supposedly haunted cemeteries? The Lady in White is said to roam the Union Cemetery late at night, and over the decades, dozens of terrified witnesses are said to have spotted her, with confirmed sightings coming from police officers and firefighters alike. On the brighter side of things, there is no wrong time to visit this incredible part of America. However, as with most states in the area, autumn will serve you with some jaw-dropping scenery, where many shades of red, gold, and orange beautifully bleed into one another. Focusing on our case today, we find the town of Greenwich in the southwestern tip of Connecticut. And unfortunately, this isn't our first time here, as I've previously covered the case of Valerie Reyes, whose body was found in the area. Now, Greenwich is not your average run-of-the-mill town. It is an obscenely wealthy part of Connecticut's Gold Coast, and is consistently ranked as one of the wealthiest cities in America. With its inviting beach spots, luscious walking trails, and spectacular views of Manhattan's skyline, the average price for property here stands at a whopping $3 million, which makes this the perfectly fitting place for this story's protagonist, Andrew Kissel. You've probably figured it out by now, but Andrew was the older brother of Robert Kissel. Born on August 23rd, 1959, he was raised by his father Bill, his mother Elaine, and alongside his brother Robert and sister Jane. All three children had a very comfortable life growing up in New Jersey, often spending their winter holidays skiing in the mountains of Vermont. Their father, Bill, was a chemist and ran his own business, Synfax Manufacturing. The company predominantly made toner for copiers, and due to the hard work by Bill, its sales and subsequent revenue were a remarkable success. The family of five lived on a two-acre plot of land on Saddle River, which was a very affluent neighborhood at the time. And alongside a swimming pool, a family boat, and several swanky cars, the children were often treated and spoiled with their father's substantial fortune. To provide some context on the personality that Andrew would develop, it is worth mentioning that there always seemed to be some form of mild competition between Robert and himself, manifesting in the brothers sometimes rivaling for success. Although Robert was younger than his brother, he was actually more intelligent and extroverted. But this didn't stop Andrew and his fiery, ambitious personality from competing against him. And although this behaviour isn't necessarily healthy over a long period of time, this contentious environment meant that both of them would eventually be propelled into lives of success. 
As you might already know from the previous video, Robert went down the path of investment banking, where Andrew himself turned towards a Connecticut favourite, real estate. Moving into the 1990s, Andrew met and fell in love with a woman named Haley Wolf. By the year 1992, the two were happily married, moving into a comfortable co-op apartment at 200 East 74th Street, just east of Central Park. Right, now this is where we come to the meat of the story, but in 1993, Andrew decided to launch his own business in real estate. After Robert gifted the company a small loan of half a million dollars, Hanrock then purchased apartment buildings in underrated neighbourhoods, flipped them, and then sold them for substantial profit. Where Robert was making over $3 million a year overseas, Andrew was making serious money back at home, and in 1995, it was rumoured that he was worth over $20 million. But this is where Andrew's reputation begins a downward descent. From 1995 onwards, he became the treasurer of the co-op board at 200 East 74th Street. While in this role, he started to have bills and bank statements sent to him directly, of course for convenience. And to add to this, he also became the sole person to sign off on their checks. Quite suddenly, repair and maintenance around the building became noticeably more expensive, and the work being done clearly did not match the price tag of the invoices. If you haven't figured it out yet, Andrew was a complete fraudster. He would create fake companies, pay them extortionate amounts for work, and then transfer their profits into his own bank account. Andrew got away with this for seven long years, and it is estimated that through forged signatures, fake checks, counterfeit bank statements, and fraudulent activity, he made almost $2 million through the co-op between 1995 and 2002. But in the fall of 2002, suspicions about his activity began to surface. And by Christmas, Andrew knew that his years of embezzling were about to be unmasked. He agreed to repay the co-op a hefty sum of $4.7 million, under the agreement that they keep his fraudulent activities under wraps. And to prove how much of a secret man he was, but this news wouldn't even reach his wife until May of later that year. By February 2003, several things were visibly different in Andrew's life. To begin with, he sold his apartment on 74th Street and made the move to Greenwich. And although he had already handed over an eye-watering amount to the co-op, Andrew had still made a sizable chunk of money through his own business. His wife Haley and their children would eventually follow him to Greenwich, but only after several months. And this was down to their marriage becoming problematic, with Andrew turning to the world of using A-class drugs, namely cocaine. Now, their new home was very extravagant, and almost over the top. It came with a swimming pool, a stable, and enough space for an entire fleet of cars. But there was one large caveat to this plot of land, and that is the fact that it wasn't owned, and Andrew was reported to be spending an incredible $14,000 per month in rent alone. Andrew and his family seemed to be going through enough stress already, but of course, the tragic events of November 2003 were just around the corner. And then, out of the blue, Andrew's brother Robert was murdered. Following Robert's murder at the hands of his wife Nancy, Andrew and the rest of their family were left in pieces. And to make matters more complicated, when Nancy's family took her side, it ripped the family apart. Although Robert's will had nominated Nancy's father to be the guardian of his children, Andrew rushed to their aid, and eventually, it was agreed that they would be raised by him instead. Now for once, Andrew appeared to be the emerging hero from this dark, messy, and complicated story. But with his out-of-control spending habits, that wouldn't last for very long. From the very moment he received custody of the children, he began to spend ludicrous amounts of money. This included spending over $8,000 to hire a private jet to pick them up from across America, and this was all billed to his dead brother's estate. Over the following year, he billed a further 171 grand to Robert's estate, which included a $6,000 dining room table for him and Robert's kids. Which, fair enough, a family needs a place to eat. But $6,000, that thing better have been made from diamonds. Things were starting to go south on the business side of things too. From the outside, Andrew was a high-flying success. He had liquidated his real estate empire for $25 million, and although he had to cover around $8 million of debt, this should have, in theory, left him with around $17 million afterwards, right? Well, not quite. You see, more than $14 million of that was actually owed to his investors. But he never told them that he had sold all of their properties, and instead, he kept quiet and proceeded with his insane spending, using money that never actually belonged to him. Andrew's spending habits continued to worsen. He then purchased an absurd amount of luxury cars, 16 in fact, including a Porsche Cayenne, a Ferrari, and a Mercedes-Benz G-Class. An 80-foot yacht was next, followed by a stable, a beach house cafe, and then the construction of a 10,000-square-foot mansion for the family. 
He was both unstoppable and ridiculous in his purchasing, to say the least. He also opened up a new business as a developer, building residences in the Greenwich area, which was a very curious decision to make, given that Andrew had absolutely no experience in this industry. Throughout this period, Haley became increasingly frustrated with her husband. She began to confide in Andrew's sister, Jane, and the two would often complain about his behaviour. To add to his cocaine addiction, Andrew turned to alcohol, making him aggressive and argumentative. He stopped putting effort into raising his children and began a sordid affair. And to absolutely no one's surprise, Haley was utterly sick of him. Several messages sent from Haley to Jane said the following. It is brutal work taking care of five kids. I get impatient, stressed, frenzied, and am prone to the occasional rant. I'm leaving Andrew. He's having an affair and has embarrassed me enough. I am busting my ass taking care of five kids. All while he is off having dinner with her at nice restaurants and calling her all day. I can't take it anymore. It amazes me I let him treat me like that. I am a smart person. I can't believe I have stayed in this relationship this long. Let's level the playing field here. Nobody is perfect. But Andrew had become the worst type of person for sheer unashamed indulgence. He was a serial spender, a cheating husband, a drug addict, an alcoholic, and a fraud. Whatever he could, he would selfishly take, regardless of the impact it had on others. And those left in his aftermath and suffering the consequences often were those who trusted him the most. In February 2005, Haley finally reached her breaking point and filed for divorce. And just one month later, they agreed that Robert's kids would eventually go to Jane at the end of the school year to be raised by her instead. But despite the devastating loss of his entire family, Andrew remained coldly unwavering in his fraudulent activity. After an employee of Hanrock formally left the business, Andrew kept her approval stamp and began to use it to sign off many financial transactions for mortgages and other loans alike. Using the stamp, he forged multiple fake letters to declare that dozens of mortgages had been paid off, despite all of this being a complete lie. He'd then take out new mortgages on the exact same properties and bag the Delta in cash all for himself. Andrew was a lot of things, but he wasn't stupid, and with his former employee now gone, he knew that the damning paper trail would eventually lead back to him and catch him red-handed. One of those properties fraudulently signed by Andrew belonged to his wife Haley, and boy, when she found out, she was completely enraged. The pain, suffering, and betrayal that he had caused her was beyond deplorable, and in May 2005, she emailed Jane to say the following. God, I hate your brother. I could actually see myself pummeling him to death and just enjoying the sensation. Andrew continued to increase his long list of enemies, and just one month later, in June 2005, one of his real estate lawyers finally unearthed his stamping scheme. When he was asked to explain what was going on with the numbers, Andrew instead threatened to kill him. But by July, it was all finally over. He hired a criminal defense lawyer who, in response, notified the FBI, and it transpired that his frauds amounted to a staggering $41 million across three states. At the end of July, and while at the family's vacation home in Vermont, Andrew was formally arrested and charged with fraud in three states. Now after crime after countless crime, what else could you expect? But at this moment in time, Andrew was absolutely devastated. And worse for him, there was nowhere to run. Despite all that Andrew had put Haley through, she still found it in her kind heart to bail him out while awaiting his trial, giving him one last chance to spend time with his children. And throughout this period, it was required for him to wear an ankle monitor and stay in the house at all times. Honestly, at this stage, his life had crashed down around him and he became utterly miserable. Not only had his brother been brutally murdered, but his father and sister wanted nothing to do with him either. But unfortunately, that was only the beginning of his downfall. To make matters worse, he no longer had any money, and with him falling several months of rent behind, the process of evicting him from the massive home began. The move was scheduled to occur at the end of March 2006, just days before his hearing. It was at this point in time that Andrew was forced to understand the true meaning of what it's like to have a life stripped away. Divorce proceedings, losing custody of his children, creditors and possessors hot on his heels, and even the banks and title companies coming after him. His yacht and entire car collection were taken away, and all the positive connections and friendships he had built up over the years rapidly turned into bitter resentment and a long list of enemies. He was a man hated beyond words, and nobody in the area wanted a single thing to do with him. By the end of March 2006, Andrew prepared himself to lose what little of his life remained, and he had plans to plead guilty in just one week's time, leading to a minimum of eight years behind bars. 
On April the 1st, 2006, Haley, the children, and almost all possessions in the home had been moved out. But Andrew himself, he was not yet ready to leave. Haley decided to give him one last night on the property, leaving several boxes and a bed behind for him to sleep. But for Andrew, not only would this be his last night in the house, but it would also be the last night of his life. On the evening of April 2nd, 2006, which happened to be a Sunday, movers came by to pick Andrew and the rest of his belongings up. But after approaching the house at around 6pm, they rang the doorbell to receive no response. With permitted access through the front door, they called out for Andrew in the hallway, only to be met with a deafening silence in return. Room by room, they explored the house, and with most of the furniture already gone, the empty shell of the building echoed back with whatever noise they made. And after making their way down to the basement, the movers were met with a very grisly discovery. In front of them lay the body of Andrew Kissel. It was no doubt that he had been murdered. His hands and feet were bound with plastic cable ties, his shirt over his head, and he had been stabbed multiple times in the back. The scene was very grisly, as blood drenched the concrete floor beneath him. Officers arriving at the scene later described the attack as vicious and clearly inflicted with a great deal of anger. But considering how many enemies he had made over the recent years, this came as no surprise to anyone. With Andrew now dead, detectives had the hard task of finding out who had killed him. But with so many enemies, this felt like an impossibly hard game of Cluedo. Starting with the family, Haley had long shown her disgust and disdain at her former husband, and at one point in time, had even shared her fantasies about killing him. And then there were the many friends that Andrew had, or should I say former friends, as he had swindled many of them through his previous schemes. And after realising he had spent millions of their hard-earned cash, there were also many investors and tenants after him as well. With no sign of forced entry, investigators thought it was very likely that Andrew knew of his killer, or at the very least, he was comfortable enough letting them inside the property. And for the longest time, investigators had no idea who the killer was, or even where to begin. Unfortunately, they had so many people with motives to comb through, and eventually they hit a wall. The case looked destined to become cold, but then, two years later, an arrest was finally made. The man's name was Carlos Trujillo, Originally from Colombia, he and his cousin and several other family members arrived in Connecticut for a brighter future. Around this time, and while in the area, he and his cousin Leonard connected with Andrew. Andrew had come to learn that the two were hard-working people, and so, in faith, he hired them into his business Hanrock. Investigators initially drew their interest on this man mainly by his ever-changing story about where he was on the night of the murder. Initially, Carlos told officers that he drove to Bridgeport after dropping off some items at Andrews. The next time, he told police that he went to Queens and then to Bridgeport. And then, several months later, he claimed that he had hired a prostitute to bring back to the mansion. But after allowing investigators to search his car, residence, and storage unit, nothing suspicious was unearthed. He even allowed them to conduct a polygraph test, which he partially failed. But two years later, in March 2008, while searching a suspect's home, officers discovered a credit card linked to Andrew. And when they formally questioned Carlos's cousin, Leonard, it became evident that he had a terrible poker face. It turns out that Leonard told investigators that Carlos had paid him $11,000 and a computer to help murder Andrew. Now, the news shocked officers, but let's be real, it was precisely the right information they wanted to hear. With Leonard admitting that he accepted the money from Carlos to kill Andrew, detectives finally had a shot at solving this case. Leonard would eventually even drive the police to Connecticut to show the various stores they had purchased supplies for the crime, and many of those supplies found at the store, namely the cable ties, matched that found at the crime scene. But Leonard would never actually admit to being part of the murder itself. The man claimed that he was a mere pawn to the plotting and preparation of it, and later stepped back entirely. In the spring of 2009, Leonard Trujillo pleaded guilty to manslaughter and conspiracy to murder. He testified against Carlos during his trial, and claimed that he had backed out of the deal after getting his money. Otherwise, he stated that he had no idea what happened that night. Carlos Trujillo would eventually stand trial too, and finally, on November the 30th, 2010, which was four and a half years after Andrew had been stabbed to death, it began. The prosecution argued they believed Carlos and Leonard gained entry to the property by bringing Andrew cocaine. Andrew had approximately half a line detectable via toxicology at the time of his death. Carlos was well known to frequently deal the substance to Andrew. The items that Leonard had pointed out to officers matched those found at the crime scene. 
based on the location of blood spatter pattern, which formed an arc on the wall. Forensics believe that Andrew was kneeling at the time of his death. But as for a motive, why would Carlos have wanted Andrew dead? It turns out that when authorities froze all of Andrew's assets, Carlos and his family helped him launder money throughout their personal bank accounts. In the process, more than $200,000 of Andrew's money mysteriously disappeared. Andrew was murdered just four days before he was scheduled to plead guilty to multiple counts of fraud. So, it would be very likely that Carlos was scared that Andrew would turn him in. It took the jury only four days to come to their verdict. But in December of 2010, Carlos Trujillo was found not guilty of the murder of Andrew Kissel. He did, however, enter a guilty plea for attempted murder, and received a six-year prison sentence in return, followed by deportation back to Colombia. Leonard Trujillo, who pleaded guilty to manslaughter and conspiracy to commit murder, received a significantly higher sentence of 20 years. Now I'm not actually sure how to process this one, as between both cousins, they were definitely to blame for his murder, but neither of them were actually found guilty. Captain Mark Marino, who oversaw the investigation, said that despite their open-ended questions and lack of murder conviction, the department still felt like justice had been served. But when comparing a 20 and a 6 year sentence, it doesn't necessarily feel like Andrew's killers received what they should have faced as a result of their actions. Andrew's funeral was a small one near his hometown in New Jersey. He was buried alongside Rob, and just over a dozen people attended. Much, much less than his own brother had drawn during his own funeral. Then again, this was borderline inevitable. Whilst Robert had always been a hard-working and generous man, his brother was eventually proven to be the exact opposite, and burned almost every bridge he had ever built between the people around him. But there were unfortunate similarities too. Both had wives who had hated them, and both were murdered before the age of 50. Which, let's face it, for the family as a whole must have been impossibly hard to swallow. And Robert's children, who are now all adults and independent, had to face the death of their father, the loss of their mother, and the death of their uncle. I sincerely hope that all three of them have now found peace away from this disastrous and tragic story. Anyway folks, I think that just about wraps up today's case. Thank you so much for being here for another video by Coffeehouse Crime. I really appreciate you being here. So what do you think about this case of Andrew Kissel? Do you think that we actually found the right murderers? Or do you think there was someone else involved in this long, twisted story? And what do you think about the prison sentences? Do you think they were justifiable, or do you think they should have got more time? Please be sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section down below. This story has so many open-ended questions, and leaves many perspectives on the table. As always, I'll see you again very soon for another video, but until that moment arrives, please remember to look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you very much, and goodbye.